Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, I am having on someone that I've been trying to get on for a while, and that is Gillian Perkins. If you hang around in the internet business space, which I have for a long time just because I'm interested in homesteading and homemaking, but I'm also interested in building businesses. This is energizing for me to come up with something creative and to build it has been fun for me since back in the day when I was sewing dresses on Etsy and mailing kefir grains. Anyways, I love online business. If you can't tell from, you know, starting a podcast, starting a blog, starting a YouTube channel, this kind of stuff is really fun for me. And Gillian Perkins has been someone that I've looked up to for a while. Actually, I'm pretty sure she's younger than me, (laughs) but she has just done such a great job of sharing how she is able to build a business while also being a mom. So she has five kids. She homeschools. And her goal has been to to find a business, to build a business that works for her family, but yet doesn't interrupt the flow of family life. And she can be a mom. And she has this podcast called Work Less, Earn More that I really enjoy because she talks about some of these strategies and passing up cer- certain opportunities and just figuring out how to work a lot less. Because a lot of us think like, if I start some kind of online business, this means I'm going to have to lock myself away for 40 hours a week in an office, which, you know, most of us don't have the time to do. And so I found her content very inspiring over the years. So I really wanted to have her on because I love to talk about occasionally on here entrepreneurial endeavors because it is such a fun, motivating part of my life. Now, not everyone is interested in that in my in my audience. And so if any of you feel like starting an online business is something that would be very overwhelming for you, or you just have zero desire to do it. Like if I say those words and you're like, ugh, then maybe this episode isn't something you want to listen to. But if you've wanted to, but feel like you don't have time, I think there's going to be some encouragement on how you could possibly make that happen. So let's dive into the interview with Gillian Perkins and chat mom entrepreneur life. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Hi, Gillian. Thank you so much for joining me. I will uh, be recording an intro earlier, so I'm sure I already said, like, I'm so excited to interview Gillian because I've been following you for years, and you've been a big encouragement to me in balance with business and motherhood and kids, and that is something that a lot of my audience is interested in, whether it has to do with wanting to learn something new that doesn't have to do with business or actually starting a business, balancing all of that with kids. That's the trick. (laughs) So, okay, (laughs) let me first have you introduce yourself. Tell us about you, your business, your family, or whatever else you want to share. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Gillian Perkins, and I run a business called Startup Society. And I started this business about five or six years ago now. Before that, I ran a local music studio, which was a great foray into entrepreneurship, but it mostly taught me a lot of things that I didn't love about running a business. I didn't love working 50, 60 hours a week. It wasn't that important to me, honestly. I I love running a business and I was fascinated with the marketing of the business and the strategy of the business, but my family comes first. And so I needed something that I could earn a good living for my family in less time. I also didn't really love running a local business or at least the sort of local business I was running because we had a pretty high overhead. And so that meant that I had to keep hustling just to keep paying the bills of running the business. And so, yeah, it just didn't leave me with a lot of freedom. I also felt pretty kind of tied down with my local clients, both because they were local and also because they demanded, you know, time on my schedule. So I only got paid when I was exchanging my time for money. And so all of that really just fueled this desire in me to figure out a better way to earn a living, something that gave me a lot more free time, something that had a better profit margin. Um, And that's what led me to online business. So I started experimenting with different online businesses. I started a few different startups and just tested some different business models, learned a few more things I didn't like, um, and also really fell in love with digital marketing. I tried different social media platforms and different strategies there. um, And it was just such a 
learning experience. And so then, like I said, about five or six years ago, I started Startup Society. I wanted to share with other people, you know, what I'd learned about starting online businesses and what had worked for me and what hadn't um, and just teach them those basics. And so Startup Society really took off right from the get-go. Um, that was a huge blessing and kept learning so many more things. Um, we started building these evergreen funnels in my business to uh, sell the digital products, the courses that I was building, sell them on autopilot without me having to directly promote them or directly do sales calls or anything like that. And so we really fine-tuned you know, what makes for an evergreen sales funnel, as we call it, mm -hmm. um, this automated sales system, what makes it, you know, work better or work worse. And then we've now packaged that into a program of itself called 100K Mastermind. So that's kind of where I'm at today. We continue to run Startup Society. We have a couple other programs that we offer. And so it's a digital course business, a membership business. And more than anything, you know, it's an automated online business that allows me to work for about just 20 hours a week. It leaves me all the time I need to homeschool my kids and be the mom that I want to be. Yeah. I love that your podcast is called Work Less, Earn More. So the whole goal of your businesses and how you've structured them is to make it to where you have more time freedom. That was the goal from the beginning. It also has worked out monetarily quite well, but I assume that you, know, you would choose even more time versus more money any day, which I'm in the same boat as you. Can you share with us some of the things, and I know I've listened to this on earlier podcasts of yours. Things that you've tried that maybe didn't work out or like how have you navigated your way to figuring out what it is that you love doing or that works? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. And the list is long of things that I've tried doing that yeah. didn't quite work out or didn't work out as well as I thought or hoped. It's kind of like, where do I even start? Can yeah. you tell me maybe what sorts of things are you thinking of here? Are you thinking of like ways to make money that I've tried or marketing strategies or things that I've tried in my current business or yeah, what was on your mind? Well, okay. So I know, I know one thing you've done that actually I think did work out really well is write a couple of books. So there's that. And then also like, okay, I think the first thing that we think when we think, okay, I'm going to make money online is social media, right? Like I'm going to be a big Instagrammer, mm. a big TikToker these days. So what are the pitfalls? And I know that's like a whole rabbit trail that you probably go way in depth in your startup society in, but what are some of the pitfalls whenever people think I'm going to earn an income online? The, you know, those, those things that you first think of maybe aren't in the goal of working less and earning more. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'll talk about two that are kind of like juxtaposed to each other. It's kind of like you can fall into this trap or you can fall into that trap. So a trap that a lot of people fall into is they think they need a big following to make money online. And also that having a big following will automatically equate to making money online, making a good living. I'm here to tell you less from my own experience, actually, and more from now that my audience is so large, I've met a lot of other people with large audiences, and there are just so many of them out there who have a big following, but don't have a strategic business behind it. They don't have products that they're selling that are at a high enough price point or that they're doing enough volume with. They're making a good income. And so really, maybe the only income or the majority of their income is just the ad revenue that they're getting from the platform, which is often nothing to sneeze at, but it's also not necessarily like nearly as much as they could be earning or nearly as much as they were hoping that they would earn. So it just is really important that you don't just put all of your eggs into the basket of building your audience, that you don't just focus solely on that and assume that everything else will fall into place. But you actually have a business strategy if you want to make money online. And then the flip side of that, the other mistake you could make and the mistake that was more the mistake I made is that you get really hyper-focused on the business aspect of it, maybe on the products. And the reason I got too focused on this for me was because I was focused on how do I make money online? And so I read a lot of books about like how to make money online. I read books about like courses and membership sites and publishing eBooks um, and affiliate marketing and that sort of thing. And so I was really focused on like the money making strategy, the business strategy part of it. And so I created products and I tried to market them. And then 
I couldn't figure out why I wasn't making money. And eventually one day I realized that I was lacking this essential ingredient of visibility. I had not focused at all on trying to grow Mm -hmm. my audience. Of course, I was (laughs) trying to market my products. So I was promoting them, but no one was really seeing that promotion because my audience was so small. And so then I would try to use paid ads and it didn't really work because I didn't really have the information, like the intel I needed on like from an organic audience on what they were really interested in, what messages they were responding to. So I was doing my testing with paid ads. So that was really expensive. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the trap that I fell into. So you need to just make sure that you go into it with a balanced perspective, that you have a business strategy, you have a plan going into it, or at least you make one in the early days of building your audience. But you also have a strategy for generating leads for your business and or for building your audience. Yeah, that is not to say that you necessarily need to be a big personal brand. You don't need to be a TikToker or a YouTuber or an Instagrammer yourself. It doesn't mean that you need to have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers on any of those platforms by any means. There are plenty of business models, business strategies out there that enable you to have a very small audience or even no audience at all and utilize personal connections, do word of mouth marketing, but you do need to have some sort of strategy for how you are going to reach those potential customers. Yeah. I have met in the the world that I am in now because I do a lot with online business and networking and meeting a lot of people, whether that be people on YouTube or people who who consider themselves Instagrammers or bloggers. I have met people with all of the huge numbers who, like you mentioned, aren't making any income from it. So I know for sure, and I've also met the complete reverse of that, that I think the reason why that's the the place people first start is because it's what they can see. And without really knowing what goes on behind the scenes, it's like, well, then obviously, you know, if, if that's considered success is having something that you can see, which is high numbers on these certain platforms. So I completely agree with you. And the strategy behind it is something that people... I think if they they go down that road for a little while, they realize, okay, there's there's something missing here. So, yeah, for sure. I always say that it's kind of that Instagram or social media, it's kind of like the flashiest little part that you see. It's the part that's public of their business, right? It's the tip of the iceberg that you can see. But in order to have a successful business, a profitable business, or even just be a profitable freelancer, even if you don't think of yourself as a business, you have to have the rest of the iceberg that's under the water. So you have a whole business that can make you money. You can't just have that tippy tippy top part that pokes out of the water. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's like the flash part of other people's businesses, the part you see. And so when you see someone, quote, killing it on social media, you think they must be successful. So you think that's what you need to do. But it's just not the case. But like I said, you do need to have that balance. You need to I don't I see sometimes people make the mistake of like they hear me say that and then they think, oh, that means I don't need to build my audience. Like Gillian gave me permission. I don't need to build my audience. And then they wonder why their product isn't selling. Right. Yeah. So you have to make sure you have that balance and you do have a marketing and specifically a visibility strategy for your brand, it just might not be, you know, reaching a million on Instagram. Yes, yes. And I have seen that people fall into that ditch just over and over and over again. And I get these people asking me like certain questions who have hundreds of thousands of followers. And I'm, you know, I'm learning that that doesn't necessarily mean that you've achieved what you've wanted to with it, having this large audience. Taking a break from this episode to tell you about today's sponsor, Carly Jean Los Angeles. Carly is a mom of four. She owns this small capsule wardrobe company based out of LA. The dress I am wearing today is actually from Carly Jean. I get lots of compliments on it every time I wear it. It has these very beautiful sleeves. It's flowy. They have all kinds of easy to wear basics. So everything from tanks to denim, I'm wearing the Carly Jean denim, um, not right now, but currently when I wear jeans, I wear it with a belly band. I like that I can wear these clothes through all seasons of life. They don't technically have a maternity line, 
but there are so many pieces like this dress here that are high-waisted enough that work for me through different phases. So from pregnancy to postpartum to neither uh, nursing, I can find something on there. And I like that everything looks really nice together. It feels very curated. It feels like they have already done the work for me of assembling these collections so that I can stock my closet with beautiful pieces that I can pull out at a moment's notice without giving any effort to getting ready and look decent for the day. All of the CJLA basics are made right here in the US, which I think is really awesome. Their mission is to simplify getting dressed and help women feel beautiful in every season of life. The clothing's classic, timeless, and meant to be lived in. I like things that are very easy to wear, easy to purchase, easy to collect together. I don't have a lot of time to put effort into my clothing. And I really appreciate that Carly Jean takes all of the guesswork out of that. Shopping a capsule wardrobe will save you money because you're intentionally choosing pieces that you know you'll wear on repeat in multiple ways, rather just for one specific occasion. I pull things out that I mix and match and I wear it everywhere from church to date night to just a day at home with my apron in the kitchen. Carly Jean is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 20% off the entire site with the code farmhouse20. This is a one-time use code, but you can use it off the entire site. Again, carlyjeanlosangeles.com. Use the code farmhouse20. So one question I get asked a ton, and it's, I don't even know if it's on this list here, so sorry if I stump you, but I get asked all the time, is it too late to start people? Oh, and I, I have my own opinions about this, but People do see those vanity metrics, you know, and so they think, obviously, everybody already has their followings built. It's way too late. I have, there's no way that I can still earn an income online. Like that, that ship has sailed, which I, again, I have my own opinions, but yeah, what would you say to that? Well, first of all, like of the people, you know, I, I say speaking to the listeners here, listener of the people that you know, how many of them earn their income online? How many of them have online businesses? How many of them are freelancers, right? Probably very, very few. I know personally, even though like this is what I do professionally, other people mm, I actually I know in that. real life, the number who earn their living online is like close to zero. <laughs> so that just kind of shows you, it's just like a quick mm -hmm. reality check of like what percentage of the world is earning their income this way, a very small percentage, um, which leaves everyone else to be the potential consumers of the products of online businesses. So, you know, of course, it depends on the niche that you're thinking to go into. There are niches that are pretty saturated online for sure, but there also are niches that aren't even touched. We have people go through our courses all the time. You know, we have this course that we run called Validate. It's a live accelerator program that guides people to like test drive their business idea and do the market research to figure out if there's demand. And every time we run it, most of the people are testing products that I'm like, whoa, I never thought of that before. I've never seen anyone sell that before. It, it, they are sometimes like courses about how to like do certain types of like historical tailoring. So like making clothes or courses about how to raise certain types of farm animals. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, my point here isn't no one has ever thought of that before. My point is they're not competing against hundreds of other competitors at all. You know, there might be a couple other people in the market who sell something vaguely similar, right? But the chances mm -hmm. of any customer not buying their product because there's a couple other competitors on the market is like practically none. People are out there looking for solutions to their problems. They're looking for information on different topics. They are looking for products to buy to help them overcome problems that they have. Mm -hmm. And honestly, there is so much room in the market in the general market, right? Like I said, there are some niches that are definitely way more saturated. I would not recommend that you try to sell t-shirts on Amazon. Really, please don't. <laughs> uh, but there's so much opportunity out there. Yeah, I like what you said about thinking about the people in your circle, because we all follow so many people and all of them have big followings because we follow them. But then when you brought it down to the local level, it's like, hmm, wow, I have one person that, I mean, I have some that I've met through this industry, of course, but in my mm -hmm. real yeah. town, 
I know one family living off of a very similar thing that I'm living and she happens to be my sister. Mm -hmm. So obviously, like, you know, (laughs) that's the reason is we've, you know, we've, we've shared notes, if you will. Yeah. But what I was going to ask you, you said teachers on Amazon. What are some other like niches or business models that you think people instantly think of that you'd be telling them, oh, wait, no, I've seen this over and over again. That doesn't work anymore. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I would say, first of all, there's like too much to cover here, too much ground to potentially cover. There's so many industries. So I would really encourage people to like think about this in a really practical way themselves. They're not considering every niche, every market, every potential product. Most people have a handful of different products that at least right now they're considering. And so use your common sense. Have you seen that sold a million times already and you're just trying to copy what you see other people doing and what's working for other people? Or is this something a little bit unique and you haven't seen that many other courses out there? You're trying to solve, you know, a problem that is unique. So yeah, I always say just start with your common sense. I think that that is a great grounded place to start with. Now, I also want to just like say, just because you see other people doing it does not mean that that ship has sailed and you can't do it. A lot of the time, especially when it comes to social media, we think, oh, I see so many people on Instagram or I see so many people on YouTube or, you know, on TikTok. So I'm too late to the game. But I am here to tell you that new people are breaking out on those platforms literally every single day. And if you can come up with a fresh angle or just be, you know, your own unique personality and share good quality content about, you know, a particular topic, literally any topic, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Then there is still room for you. So definitely don't let that stop you on social media. As for just a few things that I would immediately kind of call out clothing on Amazon. The reason I said t-shirts on Amazon is because clothing on Amazon is known to be a very competitive. It's really hard to differentiate yourself. There are literally millions of products in that clothing category, and it's hard to like kind of get niche with that. Um, so it just tends to be really competitive and hard to strategically break through there. Another one is people love, because of what my business does, because I teach people how to start online businesses, how to build their online business, how to automate their online business. I am to some degree in that, like how to make money online category or niche or vertical. Mm -hmm. And so people love to tell me that that is the only way to make money online. And that the only way you can make money online is by teaching other people how to make money online. That is what I happen to do, at least a a flavor of that. But it is... I would not say it's the only way to make money online. In fact, I would label it as one of the areas to generally avoid, especially if you're going to be a a generalist about it and not a specialist. You know, maybe you have some expertise, some past, some history with building sales pages for brands or with growing brands on Instagram or with uh, designing evergreen funnels, you know, something really specific. Okay, go for it. But the how to make money online space, it is one of the most competitive spaces because a lot of people have that thought like, oh, this is the way to make money online. So it is by far (laughs) one of the most saturated, especially when it comes to like online courses or memberships. I, you know, like I want to be good at what I do, of course. Right. But I hit myself on the head over and over again for choosing this niche because I'm competing against other marketers. Like I am a marketer competing (laughs) against marketers, marketing a marketing product. Like it is just the most ruthless. You're good at marketing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So (laughs) it is just the most ruthless and most difficult niche or industry to market yourself and to stand out with. I have by far the stiffest competition. So I would steer away from that. It's so much easier for my students who are selling a course about like how to raise healthy sheep for wool it's, you know, their marketing is a piece of cake compared to mine. They can say Mm -hmm. anything that as long as it's vaguely sensible, as long as it, you know, and by that, I mean, it makes sense. And they communicate this course will teach you how to, you know, raise a healthy sheep and get the wool. And as long as they then connect with the right person, the person buys immediately. There is no like, maybe I should actually buy that other course from that other person that does not happen, you know? So yeah, just choose something that is, a less common thing, especially when it comes to online courses. And that doesn't mean you need to go like super Mm -hmm. niche or go with a super obscure niche at all. I'm not saying go with your least common interest. (laughs) You you still want to choose something that there is popularity in the world for, but don't feel like you need to do what everyone else is doing. That's the main point. Yeah. And in fact, don't do that. Don't, don't, 
just if you, yeah, if you see it over and over again, think how could I yeah. maybe move slightly away from this? And I thought you probably would say the niche that you're in just because I have heard from others who are in your niche talk about how competitive that niche is. And so I've, I've experienced that. They're like, okay, <laughs> this is what I'm teaching, but don't do this. So that yeah, makes sense. For sure. Okay. Let's get into some of the the work-life balance, which has been the most encouraging thing that I have gained from you over the years because you are a homeschool mother of five. So you are very much in where a lot of my audience is, where we we like some of us, some of us do, some of us don't, but I imagine the ones who are listening to this episode like entrepreneurial endeavors, but then also feel that that conflicts with our duties as a mother. And I know that you've you've wrestled with that and you've actually found a balance. So I want to hear more about that on from you, your perspective, because this is something that I also like am constantly trying to work out for me in my own business. But yeah, how does your schedule look and how does your family life look and your free time? And yeah, yeah. that's a loaded question. <laughs> So I feel like there is, once again, kind of like two angles I could go at this with. The first angle, and, and it just depends on like where the, the listener is right now. So there's the one listener who maybe right now you are juggling a lot and you're like, how do I better juggle these things? You know, maybe you're already running a business, maybe, like you have a small business. You're like, how can I grow this business? I feel like I don't have time. You feel unbalanced, right? The other listener is the person who right now does not have a business. They feel like that is beyond them. They feel like I, I can barely keep my kids alive. How in the world does Gillian, you know, manage to homeschool her five kids and run a business and, mm, you know, find time maybe to exercise or have a social life or anything else at all? Because I feel like my kids take up all my time. And so I'd say two very different things, I think, to these two people, you know, on the to the first person, right. we could have a chat about maybe we will have this chat right now, right? We could have a <laughs> chat about like what my schedule looks like from a practical perspective, how I'm able to minimize my work, how I apply minimalism to every aspect of my life that I can. I'm by no means an extreme minimalist. I have many things in my home, but I try to minimize and simplify and get down to the kind of like the meat and potatoes of everything, to the the basic components that are going to have the biggest impact on the outcome, kind of 80-20 principle, if you will. To person B, the person who feels like, I just, I don't know how you do it. I would just like to challenge you that if you add something into your life, you will find that there is time. There have been times in my life when I did vastly more or vastly less. There was a time in my life when I was going to college, I was running a business and I was planning my wedding. No, I didn't have five kids, but <laughs> my plate was full to the max. And at the time I was like, how am I doing this? I have no idea, but somehow all the pieces fit. Um, and I've just found that to be a truth in my life that whatever I put on my plate, somehow all the things fit. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you might decide this is too much for me. I don't want to do that much. And that's totally fine. I go through these times and I'm like, oh, this is too much. And I cut some things out and we simplify. But don't feel like just because you feel tapped out right now, that means you can't add something. There's this basic principle of I want to say this is called Parkinson's law, actually, that work expands to fill the time allotted to it. And so whatever you have on your schedule right now, whatever responsibilities you have right now, they are going to expand to fill your whole day. To the woman, the married woman who has no kids, she feels like the housework occupies her whole day, you know, the housework and, you know, maybe she's working also. She feels like she can hardly keep the house clean. Then you have a couple kids and you're like, I feel like these kids take up all my day, right? But then if you add something else, you really will find the time. So the fact that your time feels full right now, don't let that stop you. Try adding something else. Give it a few months. Try a few different schedules with it. And then you can make an informed decision about whether or not there is time or you don't like to be more busy like that. But yeah, just don't stop yourself before you even give it a try because I think you're capable of far more than you might think you are. And I think you can fit far more into your day than you think you can. I want to take a break from this episode to tell you about my five-day blogging challenge. So seven years ago, I started a blog and two years into that journey, my husband was able to quit his job and we've been living on our homestead, raising our kids side by side. It was really a dream and sometimes I forget 
because it's been five years that we've been doing this uh, side by side, just how crazy it is that we are able to do this because of a blog I started seven years ago. I have a five day challenge where I like to help you figure out your strategy. It's a free challenge. We go through narrowing down your niche, crafting your brand, and coming up with a content plan for a successful blogging business. If this sounds intriguing to you, you can get that at bit.ly forward slash five day blog challenge. That's all lowercase and the five is the number five. So bit.ly forward slash five day blog challenge. Again, it'll also be linked down in the show notes or the description box if you are watching over on YouTube. I, I love the way you said that because I've really like, I ponder on this phenomenon all the time, but I didn't really put those exact words to it. But you know, whenever you have another baby and somehow all of a sudden and five, four kids sounds easy now that you have five, <laughs> right? Or yes, like in I our do case, know. <laughs> you know about that. In our case, we add a dairy cow and before we didn't have to milk a cow in the morning and the night, but now it's fine. Like it's just a part of the day. It's not really that many minutes. It's, you know, it's just like, it, yeah, I can totally get that done. But if you would have asked me when I had, you know, three kids, no business, stay-at-home mom, like, can you add on a business, four more kids, and a dairy cow? How about we just go ahead and do that? It That just, no. Like, But as the things have <laughs> come, like, because people are always asking me, like, when do you sleep? Or, you know, when do you do this or that? And I'm like, I don't know, but it fits. Like, I truly do, like, go to bed at night. And it doesn't feel as crazy as you might imagine. And of course, you know, there's a lot of factors there. Like some of my kids are older and my husband's home from his job. And so, yes, there are certain parts of that. But I can tell you just based on like the last several years that as we've added another child and, you know, added this or that, like somehow it works. I don't know. To some extent, it just keeps yes. It's amazing. Like, praise God, right? <laughs> Somehow he yeah, makes us yes. capable. I think really what it is more than anything is that God enable, like gives us the strength to rise to the occasion and that like he made this beautiful system where we learn from the, the challenges, right? So we add a new thing. Like I know for me, every time I've had another baby, I, for a, a minute or a month or three, it was very challenging. And I yeah. was like, oh no, there's not yes. enough time. But <laughs> that challenge strengthens us. Just like you go to the gym, you work out and you get sore from the gym, right? And then that is your muscles getting damaged a little bit, but then they build back stronger. And so we learn from what's not working and we get essentially smarter, if you will, and we figure out how to make it fit better. Yes. And I always feel like I have to say this like disclaimer, this caveat, and you know, you understand as an influencer, a content creator, that you almost anticipate the comments that you're going to get. You're like, okay, listen, this is not for everybody. Not everybody is called to have a business at home, mm -hmm. but I'm speaking to those who really want to and feel like they can't fit it in. That's who we're talking to. So if you're like, that's, yes. you know, not like what I want to do. I'm like, don't listen to this thing. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, for sure. And so with that, I was going to ask you about that, your Christian faith and how that impacts your work and how a lot of like this working less and having a family, why that is a priority for you and does that stem back to your faith? Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that my business is like a testing ground, like a gauntlet sort of testing ground, like have to run through the fire with my faith. And what I mean by that is that it, I think that the more you interact with other people and the more challenges you face in life, the more temptations you face also. There's temptations to not be 100% honest. There's temptations to be lazy. There's temptations to take the shortcut and to maybe not do the most... Um, it, like the thing with the most integrity. Um, so in temptations to not have full integrity. And so that forces me to like put my faith and my, my, like my trust in God. And I think that trust and obedience are so closely intertwined. My obedience to God 
to the test. Um, And the reason I say that those things are so intertwined is because I used to think that faith was like a feeling, like I feel like I trust God. But what I have come to realize is that trusting God, how you show that you trust God or how you trust God is actually by obeying God. So a lot of the time God calls us to do things that don't make sense or don't feel like what we want to do or don't feel like they're going to really lead us to our goals. And if we don't trust God, then we just do our own thing. But if we trust God, then we obey God even when it doesn't make sense, even when it is uncomfortable, even when it doesn't seem to align with our priorities or our goals. And there's perhaps no place, you know, maybe maybe homeschooling my kids, maybe my marriage, but for whatever reason, I find that my business is kind of where the rubber tends to really hit the road, where my priorities tend to be way out of whack, where I tend to want to do my own thing or take the shortcut the very most. And so it just forces me over and over again to confront my sin, really, um, and to get right with God. Yeah, yeah. And there's also this temptation as your business grows and you become more successful, you can clearly see how by putting more effort in can equal X amount of dollars, which... I mean, when you've built a business online, looks a lot better than, you mm-hmm. know, an extra 30 bucks an hour or whatever. If I put in this extra hour, I have this opportunity. I'm sure a lot of opportunities are coming your way that are hard to pass up. And it requires you laying down some of these opportunities. Yeah. And how do you, what's the filter that you run them through? Like when you are presented with a new opportunity or another way that you can earn a significant amount more income, how do you filter it out and decide what's worth it? I would say that it's really mathematical based off of, you know, I have a limited amount of time. I've decided ahead of time that I'm only going to put in 25 hours per week max in my business. And I normally try to aim for and and achieve 20 hours a week. And so in that limited amount of time, I just am going to take the opportunities that are going to net me the most positive gain. Now, of course, figuring out which those opportunities are is quite a challenge, right? Quite a trick. Yes. But um, Mm -hmm. that is my priority. So because I've defined that boundary ahead of time, it's very rarely about like, will I work these five more hours and sacrifice those five hours with my kids because I could make, you know, this large amount of money from that? Like, that's not really a question I'm ever asking myself because I set that boundary ahead of time. And so really, I'm just trying to optimize for the highest profit, highest hourly rate activities I can do within that time. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. That's very straightforward. (laughs) Okay. So I, whenever I have a podcast guest on, we like to pull the audience, uh, Instagram following is just the easiest place to do it and ask them some of their questions that they would want to ask you. And the first has to do with that pull, like we were just talking about between family life and work life. And some of these people, you know, some of these moms haven't started a business. And so they are like, their questions have to do with the very beginning parts, like how to push and try to grow a business from scratch without sacrificing time with the kids and still being able to prioritize family and your husband. So I know you and I are kind of in this established phase of our businesses where, you know, I know just exactly what I need to do. I know I can, I can get it done in X amount of hours and it, it doesn't feel like as much like, will this even work? Because we already know it'll work. And so we already, it's not hard to put time into something that you know will yield X, Y, Z. But in the beginning, whenever you were taking some time that you could have put other places in your, your family or your homemaking, not really, I guess, no, necessarily knowing that it would pay off for sure. How did that look and how did you strike the balance in those earlier years? Yeah, for sure. So I have two pieces of advice. One of them is there is this miraculous thing. Children sleep more than adults. <laughs> so yes, pretty much all a kids. A lot more. <laughs> not quite all kids. I know there is like, the, the occasional kid yeah. who does who sleeps mm-hmm. less, but most of them sleep 10, 12 hours a night. Adults normally seven or eight hours a night. And maybe your child mm, yeah. is napping also. So 
that is, I would just say like the perfect little time to get in working on your business for a couple hours every day without really sacrificing any time with your kids. So whether that means waking up a little bit earlier or just working after your kid goes to bed. Yeah, I think that's kind of the sweet spot. There also might be other times in your day, especially depending on the age of your kids, when your kids are busy with some other activity. So maybe when your kids are at school, maybe you let them have a little bit of screen time every day. Maybe there's a time when they're predictably playing outside, but just think about that, be intentional about it, because there is this definite natural instinct to, oh, my kid is finally occupied. I will take a rest on the couch. But maybe what you need isn't so much like a physical rest as like a mental change of pace. So maybe just instead of like Mm -hmm. switching your habits from maybe turning on the TV when your kid goes to play outside to opening up your laptop and working on your business just for half an hour or something like that. So be strategic about it. Be intentional about it. Um, I think that if you think about it, you'll find some times when you're not busy momming. The yeah. other thing is chances are you're going to have a hobby. You are you probably aren't someone who works the whatever, you know, the 16 hours that you are awake every day at your job or taking care of your child. Most people find some time, make some time to relax or have some sort of hobby. And maybe right now you're just watching Netflix or maybe you are watercolor painting or, you know, but probably you have some sort of hobby or downtime. And so how could you replace one of those activities with something that would be profitable for you with working on your business specifically? There's this saying that you should have a hobby that keeps you fit, a hobby that makes you money, a hobby that makes you friends, um, and a hobby like that gets you in nature or something like that. So you want to have like a hobby for each of these different reasons or purposes. And then people love to be like, well, my hobby hits all of these things. Like I follow this one woman on Instagram who invests in real estate. Um, and especially in the early days of her business, she was buying like fixer uppers and then physically like fixing them up herself, not hiring stuff out. She was going in and like doing the work herself. And she was like, this is my hobby that, you know, I am networking because of it. So I'm making friends and it's keeping me physically fit and it's making me money and it's fun. <laughs> so Working on your business, I don't think it's going to probably hit all of the activities, especially if it's an online business. You're probably not going to get some exercise with it. (laughs) Um, But I do think it can be a way to make friends. It can be a way to make money. It can definitely be something you do for fun, especially as you start to really build your business. You're probably going to find some activities in it that you really love to do. Um, You know, maybe you love working on your website. Maybe you love the networking aspect. Maybe you love designing your products or actually physically creating your products. And so that that part of your business, that can be kind of your fun, your hobby part. And then the other part, you know, well, it's going to work, right? And But you have to make time for that part too. Yes. I like the very practical advice in the beginning of, well, kids do sleep more. And that's exactly how I did it in the beginning because I've, I've considered myself, you know, a stay-at-home mom through all of this. And of course, there's times whenever I, I put in some hours that I could otherwise, like my kids are, they're all playing outside right now. But in the beginning, they were all little. Well, I I guess my oldest was maybe eight around the time, maybe seven when I started my business. And yeah, they, they go to bed earlier. We had a schedule and I just used that time. And I find that if you use it consistently every single day, it really adds up. Like you were saying, you spend 20 hours a week on your business. And I'm sure, you know, your husband gives you time in your office where you can do that. But then also you could have 20 hours a week just in those sleepy time hours almost. Yeah, for sure. Like if your kids are young between nap time and then just working after they go to bed, I could put in that four hours a day just in that kid's sleeping time. Mm -hmm. And then if your kids are older, you know, maybe they're, like I said, busy with activities. Right, right. Taking a break from this episode to tell you about a sponsor that I have been loving for, I think over a year now, and that is Tubes & Co. Tubes & Co. offers skincare products, cosmetics that are made from high quality ingredients like grass-fed tallow, so many quality ingredients, nothing bad, no artificial dyes, preservatives, scents. You can trust that everything you get from them has quality ingredients, but then it's also such high quality stuff. In the past, I have had this issue with makeup where I want to look like I'm wearing makeup. 
I want to have the coverage on my skin, but then I also don't want any of the chemicals that will absorb into the skin. And so I feel like I have to choose between quality and health. And I finally have some makeup that I absolutely love. And that is from Tubes & Co. I've referred all of my friends and my family are constantly asking me and we're all Tubes & Co. customers now. I have their liquid foundation. It is by far my favorite foundation I've ever tried. So I just ordered a new one. I love it. I have their mascara again, quality yet actually feel like I'm wearing regular mascara. And then I just now I'm trying their natural eyeliner and I've also loved their brow pencil for the longest time. It has this angle on the end so it makes it really easy even if you're not a makeup artist which I am not and then a brush on one side so if you need to fill in your eyebrows it makes it very straightforward I just this time for the first time tried their glow serum I find that with my skin as I get older if it's dry the makeup just cakes on and looks horrible but if I'm nice and moisturized my skin looks more youthful that glow serum is absolutely wonderful Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order with the code FARMHOUSE. So this is a one-time use code. There are some things that you have been really wanting to try out that are natural yet still really effective and make, won't make you miss your favorite brands of cosmetics or skincare. Definitely also try the tallow balm. You should definitely try Toops & Co. So head on over to Toops & Co. That's T-O-U-P-S and Co. Dot com and use the code FARMHOUSE to get 10% off your order and try out some wonderful, beautiful, natural and organic skincare. Okay, so as mothers, do e this is a question, I guess, for both of us. Do either of you struggle to be mentally present with your children instead of having business ideas constantly on your mind? Um, I would say not generally, <laughs> but there have been times when I struggled with that. Some things that I found have helped me avoid that. One is that a lot, I tend to be rather problem focused. And so when there is a problem in my business, then I can kind of be distracted because I'm thinking about it all the time, trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, but the more systematic my business has become, the less I've struggled with that. And also I used to really struggle with feeling pulled between a million business ideas. But when I finally decided to just focus on one business idea, um, just choose one niche and really, yeah, just minimize my business in that way then it cut out a lot of the noise. It made the process a lot simpler. I was able to just ignore the other ideas uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. So that really helped. And then another thing that helped was separating my work and home life a little bit. Um, so setting aside a, an office space, you know, whether that is a spare bedroom or even just a corner of your bedroom. At this point, I have an office that's in a that's on our property, but outside of our house. And so that works really well for me. Although, you know, mm -hmm. that's not to say that there's not something nice about just like plunking down on the couch and working for half an hour, you know, and getting something done. But it does really help me to separate my, my brain so that I'm really not thinking about work almost at all when I am focused on the kids. Yeah. Um, and then one more thing is just writing down my ideas so that they're not like continually swirling around in my head. When I have an idea, I try to write it down like physical paper, write it down. And then I don't have to keep thinking about it because I know I'm not going to forget it. And so, I, you know, I might keep thinking about it a little bit, but I'm not going to keep going around in circles with it. I'm going to progress with it. Like I already wrote down that version. So now I'm thinking like, oh, what will come next? And there tends to be a lot fewer of those progressive thoughts than the swirling around thinking about the same thing over and over again, making sure I don't forget it sort of thoughts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do the same thing. I'm constantly taking notes. I think it's partially personality based. I've been thinking about business ideas for forever. So that's a regular part of my brain. It's not something I have to force myself to do. It's actually just very natural and it fuels me. It motivates me. I like doing new things. I like learning new things. And so I, I, I would say that as far as how it mentally affects me, for the most part, I think it's probably positive for my personality type, but there have been seasons like I'm feeling particularly energized right now. And I think that's because it's spring it's sunny. Uh, I'm not in, you know, the first trimester of pregnancy. So 
if you would have asked me this maybe six months ago, I might have been like, yeah, I struggle with that. I don't even know. And right now I'm like, no, it's great because I'm when I'm doing this, I'm thinking of this and it's like all very exciting for me. So I think that is just a season thing depending on where you are. But for the most part, um, like currently, I would say that the, the business ideas that do pop up in my brain are more of a positive thing. And I just get it out on my notes and move on until I have some time to work on it because I, like you, have some designated time to work on my business. And the rest of the time, I'm a regular mom. That's how I want to be. That's how I've structured my day. Um, I don't I don't even get 20 hours a week on it. But then again, like I, I photograph for the blog like when I'm making food sometimes. So it probably ends up like because of the type of business I run, um, it integrates with my life a little bit more. But yeah. All right. Well, I think you and I could talk forever. I have like a whole bunch more that I could love to talk to you about, but tell everyone where they can find you and follow up with you and, you know, learn more from you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. First of all, the best way to find me is to go to gillianperkins.com. Um, you can also literally just Google my name or you can look up Gillian Perkins on YouTube. That's where I publish most of my content. So there's tons of free videos there about how to start an online business if that's something that you're interested in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. I definitely could have talked to Gillian for a lot more time. I could have asked her so many more questions and just I love her input on that kind of stuff. So if you don't follow along with her, make sure to go do that so that you can you know, get more of, of her advice on starting a business as a mom and finding that balance. As always, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Yeah.